first for me is um, this, the, is, is a really good understanding of the business or industry, understanding the mechanics of how it works, how it makes money, how it adds value to its end clients, the purpose it serves within the value chain, within the ecosystem. I think that's an essential skill to build if you're ever going to be considered for a board role. The second for me is um, around developing your voice. Um, so I think, again, um, if you're somebody who has often been invisible or been quiet or sought validation and approval and off to fit in, it's really difficult to then say, well, what's your opinion? What's your voice? What are you willing? What do you really feel and believe, even if it's going to upset other people or if they're not going to like it? I think it's something I found incredibly difficult and I still struggle with today. But learning to be able to speak up, have a voice, have an opinion, even in areas that aren't necessarily my area of expertise, are really critical skills if you're going to sit on the board. There is no point and you're not going to be allowed to sit in a seat and be silent or only speak when asked to, 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 to give an opinion. And I think the third would be being able to, to, to present, to communicate, to be able to get across ideas clearly, succinctly. Um, and that is terrifying. And I remember being told in a presentation coaching that to stand up and present is very primitive, the fear that you feel. It's like when eyes are looking at you, usually in, throughout history, that meant you were going to get eaten uh, or trampled over. So the idea that you've got to overcome that fear just by doing it lots of, like any fear you've got to overcome by recalibrating that irrational fear in your brain, but getting really good at communicating clearly, at succinct, succinctly, I think is the third key skill to being able to secure kind of a, a board role. I think to be an effective board member, you need to be very clear on the value you add to the board that you're serving. Why are you there? What do they want your skills for? And make sure that you are expressing your views and supporting and helping influence the executives along that route. Call out the elephants. So for me, it has been about recognising that there is an issue that the board is dancing around or is scared to acknowledge or is blind to um, and being able to, to create the space to say, I think we're avoiding the issue. Here is what I believe we've got to address and deal with and we need to make time for. But that's not about being a problem kind of having a problem mindset and a complainer I think it's it's really having being able to bring a solution perspective to that so I think it's being able to say not only identify those problems but being able to say well what can we do and how can we try and address it that is in my experience one of the most valuable skill sets to have at the board and one of the most valuable voices at the board somebody who calls out the stuff no one is seeing or saying and is able to get you thinking about how do we address and grapple with these gnarly, knotty issues that we'd rather just pretend weren't there. I hold myself and others accountable for hiring diverse, diversity, for um, and and that's through a number of things, including having diverse panels, uh, interviewing panels, but also making sure that we have uh, diverse candidates uh, being interviewed, considered for roles, blind CVs. Um, uh, I also hold myself. I am held accountable for um, the diversity um, of my team. Uh, with three-year targets and one-year milestones that I have to report on and, and reporting that goes to the board. Um, we, uh, we can, we've done that now for many years uh, in terms of gender diversity. We, in the UK, uh, are encouraging everybody to self-identify so that we have a baseline that we can start measuring and tracking and holding our managers accountable 
Um, and then most importantly, this is all about diversity, but then creating the environment that encourages um, inclusion with the goal at the end of the day of everybody feeling like they belong here, like this is the only place they want to work. Of course, I could talk about lots of different things, but the main thing that comes to mind is creating a really safe space to have the conversations and to create change through those conversations. Can you go slightly left field here? So I'm a big believer in children changing the world. And I think that if you can change the life of one child, that that effort will change is magnified through society. So for me, the things that I've done are, are a lot of mentoring. Um, I'm a counsellor for mental health for children. Um, and I have been a trustee on lots of education charities. Support people, understand people have different needs and requirements, but also give them the encouragement they need when they are not feeling their best at work. So in terms of building a diverse team, you really have three levers. One is to recruit diverse individuals. The other one is to make sure you retain them. And finally, you need to uh, promote them as well internally. And when we're talking about promoting them internally, it's really around giving exposure, to um, giving the opportunities to them where they can uh, go above and beyond their day role, they can have a stretched assignment and, and you can shine a light on their capabilities and their skill sets. Um, I think when we're talking about retaining individuals, the I in the D, E and I, the inclusion side is really important because you can hire a lot of diverse candidates, diverse people, but you need to make sure that they feel included within the firm. And that also happens throughout the whole organization and you need everyone to feel included. That's the only way you're going to perform better than your next competitor. Um, so it's, it's, it's really around those three elements working in tandem. Uh, to, to be able to bring a diverse group of individuals together in, in, in an organization that is a high-performing organization. There's all the usual stuff, sitting around board tables, looking at the right data, making sure you get the right data, and that the numbers are moving in the right way. But more importantly than that is being prepared to be open about yourself and when you meet people who you believe have got the capability to progress, to take an interest in them, to show uh, that you believe in them, and to encourage them, help them, listen to them, and, and give them opportunities to spread their wings. I've encouraged diverse talent progression by on the boards that I serve by making sure we're focused on outcomes and we're focused on being very clear on how to move the organization further. It's about being very clear that this isn't a tick box exercise. It's something to actually move the dial and to benefit the firm in its ability to be dynamic and to change as the industry changes. And we can't do that if we all look the same. As a leader, having a diverse talent pool is super important. And the way in which I encourage that is by asking the right questions. So I'm not a fan of hard and fast targets. I think it's important that we meet diversity um, through a willingness to engage in it. So we have targets and, and they're great as a, as a target. However, on a practical level, as a, a, each and every manager needs to challenge their people, whether that's you know, the recruiters we use and whether they have a diverse talent pool, whether they're presenting us with a broad range of people. And, and by diversity, I mean, you know, ethnic minorities, I mean, um, social, socially, um, socially diverse populations, it, it's the broad range. Um, and then when we look at promotion criteria, being the grown up in the room who asks the question, what's the diversity cut? How have you thought about this? Why are none of your females or, or whatever it may be up for promotion? Looking at how we review people and looking at the way that the data cuts and being there to challenge that, um, playing an active role in um, 
gender pay gap and making sure that the the way that we're paying people is fair based on equivalent roles. But to me, it's about asking the questions and challenging people because for the most part, um, people aren't bad people. They we, we just all have inbuilt biases and we need to be challenged just to provoke the thought to actually say, actually, am I doing the right thing for the right reasons? I think here at, at Bearings, um, we're very lucky that we have already a very diverse um, pool of talent, specifically the team that I work um, at. We are a, a very, very diverse team, so I, I don't think we can possibly improve further. But what all of us are doing, I think, f- focusing what we can I- impact is, is, is uh, you know, A, the hiring uh, and all the activities that go into the hiring, um, the programs that we have for interns, the students that are sort of step before their career decision making, um, working working with these groups to explain the industry to them, to encourage them to apply, uh, to apply, to explain all the range of jobs that they can have and and that, that sort of thing. So hiring would be the, the obvious thing that, that we are doing and, and I think that's, that's, um, that's impactful. But also internally then, um, when we need to fill a position, I think looking internally, maybe in less obvious places, there are maybe from a different department um, and not a straightforward fit, but somebody that you can train or somebody that you you know has potential you can work with. Um, I, I think this is something that that's that's often overlooked, and it's obviously a lot easier to hire somebody that exactly fits the uh, fits the role. But I think we need to look within and, and maybe less obvious places and, and, and see if, if we're missing something. Um, and, and that would be the two areas I think are the most impactful ones. This has been something I've cared a lot about um, throughout my career, but I had the chance to really put it in practice um, when I became CEO. So it was something really important. I knew that this that building a more diverse and inclusive firm wasn't just about attracting diverse talent. It was about creating an environment in which that talent could thrive and succeed and progress. One of the first things I did was to create opportunities for self-management and leadership in the organization. So I shared the idea of self-managed teams and took kind of board level issues or executive level problems, issues, projects, and shared them with the whole firm in open town halls to say, here are some of the problems we're grappling with. I'm really interested in seeing people put their hands up and get involved in helping us solve them and giving people a chance to come together in small groups, small kind of communities of either problems that they shared equally or things they were passionate about or skills that they had, gave people a chance to be able to do something outside of their day job, bring others together demonstrate that they've got an ownership mindset, show how they could deal with difficult problems and challenges, but also demonstrate leadership, presentation and communication with the relevant divisions, departments and heads. So it was a real kind of organism level change that I felt was kind of a really clear way of giving people that platform and opportunity that wasn't based on hierarchy that wasn't based on some of the, I guess, historical barriers and, and, and issues we, we would face. So I think that's the first one. The second one was around moving our kind of performance measurement and management process to continuous management. So we put in place a tool that allowed people to put their objectives in continuously, to update them continuously, to get feedback continuously. And critically, we moved our kind of pay promotion reward reviews even though the decisions were only annual we would talk about our staff three times a year and for me this was really critical because what it allowed us to do is not only have the tools and technology that meant we were gathering data all the time but immediately by talking about people three times a year you weren't just relying on those who spoke louder when it came to pay and promotion time those who were more visible um, and or you know presented themselves better or whatever else it was there were a whole bunch of biases that we were able to silence or, or bring down um, in creating a more level playing field um, 
we've talked a bit about sponsorship and mentoring, and I think that's critical. So actually, again, our industry, I think, is a really great industry for apprenticeship type models. It's the type of industry where you, you can't learn much from a book. You, know, you can do your CFA and you can do your actuarial or accounting or whatever else you do, but it doesn't actually give you the tools you need to succeed. You learn by doing and by someone giving you the space to fail and make mistakes and learn. And so having somebody give you things to run with and or to be able to take those things from your leaders, your bosses, your managers to run with are really important um, kind of within that. Um, so sponsorship and mentoring. And I think the final bit that was the real clincher for me was recognizing that I couldn't change a culture from the top by myself. And the, the reason most people leave a company is because of their manager. And so the critical layer and the multipliers in the organization were managers. So uh, in 2017, I created a team leader workshop, which was mandatory for anyone who managed anyone in the organization. So once a quarter, you had to turn up to the team leader workshop if you, if you wanted to be able to manage people. And it's at that group where we agreed, what are the norms? What are the sorry, what, not the norms, what are the expectations that we've got to fulfill? So what are my expectations of you as leaders in this organization? And what are the expectations of the people, not only you lead, but also serve, that you've got to fulfill? Turning up prepared and on time, um, caring about that individual's well-being and career and ambitions, holding them to account, et cetera, et cetera. So we agreed what the five criteria of a successful leader were and then went further than that in um, gathering anonymous feedback from staff on their managers on how they're doing against those criteria, which we would play back in these meetings. And it wasn't used to shame and, and put down, it was actually used to celebrate. So we'd say, hey, this person is doing really well in holding people accountable. Can you tell us what you're doing? And what we found was people learned far more from their peers than from external people coming in and giving presentations who don't have your organizational context. So we were able to transform our line management layer, which, was, which allowed us to transform the culture of the whole business through a getting together, agreeing what success looked like, and then getting regular feedback transparently with, a, with an in safe space in which you could learn and improve. Um, that for me was the real kind of kind of final and, and kind of key key piece. Well, the essence of psychological safety is about being able to speak up without fear of the repercussions or consequences of what you say. So I think that's that tone has to be set from the top. So it's your leadership, your CEO, your leaders demonstrating that they are open to challenge and question. So it's one thing asking for it. It's another thing celebrating it and recognizing when people have challenged you and questioned you and made you think about something that you hadn't considered yourself. And I think that can't just be done once. It has to be done continuously because that voice in your head that says, just be quiet, just keep your head down, is irrational and will stop you from speaking up, even if we did it once and it was okay, the voice will come back. So you've got to consistently demonstrate that not only is it safe to speak up, it is encouraged, desired, and the key to success. I'd say being patient and trying to look on the bright side. I'm a fixed income analyst, so I often think about what could go wrong when it comes to investment. But in general, I try to look on the bright side. I enjoy what I do, so focusing on positive aspects in my job wasn't difficult. At the same time, I've learned to voice my frustration selectively to make sure that company knew that I wasn't happy about my setback. It was my obligation to share the feedback. If company wants to keep you, they should probably care about how you are feeling. 
So you pick your battle and be patient. I think when you're faced with a setback, it's very easy to to come inwards into yourself and to revert. Actually, the way I've dealt with it in the past is I've seen it as an opportunity. I've actually seen it as a as a time to be able to reset. To and what I've done is I've gone back to a blank sheet of paper, and I've thought about what could I do, or what can I do better, or what have I learned, and what don't I want to do again. So actually, it's an opportunity to change things and to grow from them. So actually, I see opportunities as my biggest learning experience, and actually, they've been so helpful to progress my career going forward. I've always put it on me, not on the environment or the people around me, in terms of why there was a setback. So I, I took the responsibility for the setback, and um, uh, picked myself up figuratively, and um, uh, and tried to learn from the situation. So as, as we spoke about earlier, I'm never ever defined by the environment um, in which I operate. I am defined by my uh, actions and reactions uh, to it, to the things that happen around me and to me. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it, it's always been about learning from the situation and making sure that I'm um, uh, um, re-centered around the things that uh, matter from a um, uh, goals, motivations, and the how to get there perspective, again, aligned with who I am as a person, as an individual. Firstly, be open and honest with yourself. No one is ever perfect. At different um, points of your career, you will have different development points. Um, the external environment, the expectations of your organization will continue to evolve. So always be willing to evolve with it in a way that's natural to you. Um, you know, the saying, what got you here won't get you there is absolutely true. We all need to continually be open to, to evolving and changing. Um, take feedback um, and do something with it. So oftentimes we get feedback and we don't necessarily agree with it. You have to take a step back and, and assess whether there's any substance in the feedback or actually whether there's a perception out there that you need to deal with. So do something with it, either work to change the perception or take the feedback and fix whatever it is that you think needs to be done. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, is speak to people, understand what they want to see more or less of. You don't have to implement everything, but at least if you know what people's expectations are, you can be much more um, alive to, to what, what you need to do. I guess throughout my career, I have had to evolve my style. So um, early stages of my career, it was all about delivering excellent work um, and high quality and head down and delivery. At one point, I received a piece of feedback which, which essentially told me that I was doing a great job, the quality of my work was great, but I wasn't going to progress into, into more leadership roles. And the rationale for that was really that I wasn't behaving as a leader, I wasn't seen as a leader, and there was a perception that I was great at work, but not necessarily um, holding myself out to be a leader with gravitas. Um, and so I really needed to take a step back and look at the things that I was doing and the habits that I had formed that was giving the impression that I wasn't a leader and that I didn't have gravitas. And, and in doing that and being really honest with myself, I realized that there were some basic things that I really needed to change. So, you know, culturally, um, I was brought up to not speak over people who are older than me, or, you know, always give space to somebody who is older, more senior, that type of thing. 
Um, and so what I realized is that I had brought that into the workplace. So to give you an example, I'd always be the person in the room who was taking lots of notes and head down. I would never speak over people who were more senior. I'd always wait for, for, for a gap in, in, in the meeting, which sometimes didn't happen. Um, I would always give up my seat at the table to anyone who was older or more senior than me. Um, and that was in, in and of itself creating a perception that I was more junior. And I made simple changes like taking less notes, always um, speaking in meetings and trying to add value. Um, and there's a balance between taking over the room and talking too much. Um, I, would, I would make sure that I kept my seat at the table unless there was somebody who really needed it rather than somebody who was who was just culturally more more senior than me um, and those simple changes set me on a path to to changing perception and then the, the final thing was a leader doesn't have to be the person who is is doing all of the work and in all of the weeds the leader is the person who gives you good judgment good guidance um, cares about its workforce so doing things like speaking to people on the floor and spending time with people actually was way more important than I had, uh, I had realized and, and I tried to change that.